Hi everyone and welcome back to Getting There the Podcast with me, Brogan. Today I sit down with the remarkable Debbie Bright. Debbie has fostered over 250 children in her home whilst bringing up four of her own biological children, at some point having three dogs and a micro pig. She also appeared in the reality hit series Towie. Debbie and I sit down and discuss the importance of early childhood years and the effects of childhood trauma. I promise you this is an episode that you will not want to miss. Hello Debbie. Hello darling, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, how are you? Well I'm just so pleased to be here because the pup's here. Duke, look how handsome he is. No, he's so handsome. He is. And it was quite interesting, so for anyone that's listening, obviously, hopefully, um, just as we were coming upstairs, Duke got barked at by another dog yes. and Debbie's frantically in the background, you don't understand the impact, the trauma. We're going up the stairs, the blonde hair's everywhere. You don't understand what happens. Well, it's true. And that it's is very so true. interesting because that is what I wanted to talk to you about yeah. today. It's like, I know you're very well recognised for your work in fostering. And I went and listened to some of the podcasts you've done, and I think you provide a lot of information. But I wanted to talk to you about, obviously, listen, you've had over 250 children to your door, roughly. Well, uh, yeah, I, it's gone over the 200 mark, but then I have been doing it 32 years. So anybody listening to this, don't think, what? What do you mean? But that's like, you know, 32 years of fostering. So, and um, a lot of emergency placements out of hours. So, you know, it could be that you have a child overnight and it could be you have a child for 18 years. Um, you, know, pla- you know, there's that old saying, isn't there? Like man makes plans and God laughs at them. So whatever plans are normally made, they go out the window. So you're a short-term foster carer. And a long-term foster carer. Which, if you were, for anyone who's listening to this that's not aware of that, what does that mean? So there's a there's a vast difference because um, a short term foster care is you deal with a lot of crisis work. So it's a lot of, um, you know, everything's emergency basically. So you'll get a phone call and they say, you know, we're looking for a uh, home. I mean, they say we're looking for a placement, but I don't really like that word. So I always say we're looking for a home, um, and. It depends on what age category you decide that would suit your home. So it could be a baby, primary school, teenagers, massive, massive shortage of teenage foster carers at the moment. Um, And you, they will come into your home and live with you as a family until the problems get sorted out. So it could be in all kinds of issues. So it could be drug abuse, alcohol abuse, mental health issues. Physical abuse, sexual abuse. Um, so, it, what's the shortest amount of time and the longest amount of time you've so had someone? So, the shortest amount of time is overnight, um, and the longest amount of time is because the, the some children will come in short term, and because things don't roll out how they should do, they will transfer to long term. And when they transfer to long term, as a foster carer they will ask you. So they will say, right, the, you know, we've tried everything with this family. We've looked for other people within the family unit to take the children. Um, we're now going to go over to long-term foster care. So it goes back to a panel. Um, and that is mainly for older children. So younger children, they will then go um, for an adoption order. Uh, older children, they will transfer over to long-term fostering. Because, again, there's a massive shortage of people who want to adopt older children. Most Mm. people who want to adopt want to adopt younger children. So rather than them be placed for adoption and they're on this waiting list for years and years and years and years, they transfer to long-term fostering. And when they do that, they will ask the foster carer. So if they've been with the foster carer like over a year, they will say, would you transfer to be a long-term foster carer? So that's the option that you take because if you are going in to be a short-term foster carer, you don't ever imagine that you're going to have a child for life because what is long-term fostering? Long-term fostering is for life. You know, Mm. it's not till they're 16, 18, which is, again, another big, massive debate. It's for life. So So 
long term fostering opposed to adoption means you just have them till they're eighteen, whereas adoption. Yeah, adoption, they change your, you know, you've got your name, there's no contact with the family. Um, they're basically, I don't like to say yours, because they have got other parents, you know, you've got the birth parents and the adoptive parents. So I'm very for open adoption. I'm not really a lover of anything closed, because I feel, you know, they're going to find out they're adopted. The sooner they find out, the better, because they grow up knowing they're adopted, rather than yeah. somebody tell them when they're 15 or 14 or 16, oh, actually, you're adopted. We all know that open adoption is much better for children to grow up knowing that they had a history, a life, before they were adopted. And they have access to that history. And they have access when they're 16, 18. But a lot of adopters now, they will, you know, have memory books, they may have photos of their birth parents that they can show them as they're growing up. And then it's not any great big shock, is it? It's not like they get to a certain age and they go, what? I mean, re traumatized yeah, from whatever they've already gone through. You know, it's something because then again, as well, I find as well, if we do go along that path, you know, it's human nature that these children who become adults, you know, put their parents on a pedestal and they think, oh, they're going to meet their parents and live happily ever after and it's all going to work out great. And we all watch long lost families, and you know, majority of the but time, you cry your eyes out. and it, majority of the time, it does all end up great. But there is also a massive majority time that it doesn't. You know that they do meet their parents. It isn't what they think. They get let down again, and there is another lot of trauma and stress involved. Um, so long term fostering is completely different. Again, like I said, it's always older children. You never get really children go to long term fostering who are under five. It's always over five. Um, and they will continue to see their family. So they will continually have contact with their family. The courts will decide that. So it could be three times a year. It could be every other weekend it would depend on a judge it won't mm. depend on the foster carer and it won't depend on social services it will depend on what the judge is given as evidence and then they will decide what the contact orders Children have much say in that uh, again that's age appropriate so they would be appointed a guardian at litem and that is a solicitor who is there just for the child so they will have nothing to do with social services or the parents they will be just getting the child's view and um, so again it's age appropriate you know there's only so much a child can understand about what's going on at five six seven so depending on the child yeah they 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 will get appointed a guardian at litem the stuff that i've listened that you've done you remain extremely positive about your fostering journey um and I know you would have come across so many challenges. And when that small child comes to your house and they've felt so unsafe and so unseen, and I think any parent can take away from this, is like, how do you start by, I suppose, peeling away the onion and starting making them feel safe in your house when you don't know how long you're going to have them for? So it's like almost like you let down their guard and then they can go again. Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, chill, everybody's different. That's the first thing. So you can, there's no set rule for mm. every child. And, you know, that that opens a minefield because what, mer what might work for one child completely won't for the other. So I think for me, it's just 32 years of experience has taught me so much. And, you know, there isn't a tick box rule for every child. No, um, so you start really at the beginning. So, you know, when a child comes to your home, again, it's age appropriate. Um, you know, just be yourself. And, you know, your your home has to be warm and comforting and inviting. Um, smile, you know, don't talk at them, you know, talk with them. Um, take things slowly if necessary. Um, I think the one massive, massive asset, and I get asked this a lot, is children trust children, not adults. And I was always praise my children for fostering. You know, I feel that they've done so much more than probably what I have because 
I've got four birth children um, and I started fostering when the older two were very, very young and they know no different. So my children know no different. It's a life that they are used to. They don't know what it is to live without fostering. But they have been the rock of my 32 years and without them I wouldn't have been able to do it because they're the ones that read bedtime stories. No they're way. the ones that changed nappies. They're the ones that helped bath them. They're the ones that held their hands going to school. They're the ones who comforted them when they were crying. So children will trust children. And all of my children that I fostered, you know, would have gone to my children for comfort before they come to me. And then they normally work out, you know, can I trust her? Can I trust, um, you know, having a cuddle? Can I trust her sitting on my bed reading a bedtime story? And listen, my house isn't, please, everyone listening, don't think that I'm, you know, I'm going to say that my house is rose tinted glasses with roses all outside. And it's like, no, but there are some nice sunflowers <laughs> yeah, in yeah, the yeah, you know, stained glass when I mean, you arrive. It's just not, you know, it is a madhouse. It is a crazy house, you know, and there is shouting and there is arguing and you do get conflict with children. But I never ever thought of it as if one of my birth children and a child who was in care were arguing I never ever thought of it like oh it's the child in care they're all brothers and sisters and all brothers and sisters argue mm. and you have to have that mentality um challenges I mean yeah there's been masses of challenges and again it's just through experience that I've learned how to deal with them and I don't really get stressed about anything, Brogan. Yeah, like. I know. <laughs> We're hardly <laughs> having a break. The, the puppy, the baby, the puppy's had mud in its mouth and I was flapping. <laughs> We're like, calm yeah, down. No. But you have a very, very busy house. I mean, only the conversation we had downstairs. You, like, at one point, how many children could you have in your house? So four, five, six, seven, seven, eight. A couple of dogs. You said a pig, no, a I guinea mean, pigs that live forever. Yeah, I mean, at one point I had... Seven children, four dogs, two guinea pigs, two rabbits, and some goldfish, I think. So, oh, and a pig. Right, okay, and so, a pig, and the mic. So that's pig. enough to make me want to jump out of a window, yeah? <laughs> so there's a few <laughs> things that I want to just p put our head in that scenario, right? How do you give adequate time to each child? Because they're a child that have come through you, are going through a process and trauma, like, and then you've got your own kids. Like, I don't want to speak for you, but I imagine the people, the children that come to your house when they leave, they're that little bit better or safer or happier than they were. And I know that kind of, that's important to you and fun's a massive part of the house. But how do you ensure that these children that are going through their process and going through their trauma are seen and heard when it's that busy? Well, you can't because, I mean, and this is when I was, when I started fostering, so when my four were younger, I used to go to bed crying my eyes out sometimes. I, I remember get, putting my head on the pillow thinking, I'm so exhausted and then there's challenges and, you know, I've got to get to the school and this one's got a hospital appointment, that one's got a dentist appointment, the social worker's visiting, the guardian at Lighton's visiting. And you feel like you can't please everyone. You try to, but you you can't please everyone. And... Um, you know, I've beat myself up so much over the years and realistically now I can look back because all of the children have said, and I'm not just talking about my birth children, but long-term foster children, short-term foster children, and say that they all had a wonderful childhood because in life you can't always get what you want. And the stepping stones for them to go on to being an adult is, number one, you have to compromise. Number two, you can't always have what you want. Number three, you have to negotiate your way through life and get on with people. Number four, there's always someone worse off than you. Number five, you know, sharing is caring and it doesn't matter what age you are. Sharing is one of the most important things in life. And number four, like... If you can share your mum and dad for the whole of your life, you know, you can do anything. Do you know what I mean? You can do absolutely anything. And I think 
you know, that's that's the asset of like having all those children because they all learn from each other. They didn't just learn from me. They all learn from each other. So it could be that they learn um, about different cultures. It could be that they learn like what triggers people and, you know, how they would have to navigate through life because, you know, none of us actually know who we're sitting next to. None, none of us know what the other person's going through. And I feel like my birth children are really good at picking up on that. And they've got masses of empathy, and I think em- quite good energy readers, aren't yeah. they? Like they can tell, and they know they're, they're very good naturally in their response and stuff. Like, I mean, I remember when I just bumped into Lydia, and I just split up with Henry's dad, and it was just like she didn't even have to say much, but she just. And I think that's a really beautiful thing because it's it's the energy that they present, yeah, and, and that you know that's developed. It's not yeah. that's not something you can go and buy in a shop, or you can read a book and have it. It's about development. And they've developed that from a very young age. And I think empathy is such an important part of children's life. And, you know, if you've got no empathy, you've got nothing at all. So you, what, touching back on just what you spoke about then, about you went to bed and cried. Yeah. Did you not think at this point, right, I need to set some boundaries. I can only have two or three or... Whatever number it was, care yes, children with yes, you. Yes, yes, I did. I thought about that a lot of times. But then you get the phone call saying, oh, Debbie, like, we're really struggling. You know, can you just take this child and, you know, we'll put this support in or, you know, we'll help you with this and, you know. Do they give you the right amount of support and help? I, I mean, I must say, I, you know, there has been times in my life that I felt that they haven't. But then there's been millions of times that I felt they have. And, uh, I mean, I go back to, like, my (laughs) children. And I I, like what I'm saying. I always, you know, used to think, oh, God, you know, I've not got enough time for that. I've not got time. And I remember um, Lydia, like, she wrote, uh, she was doing her GCSE English. And I went into a school for parents evening. And one of the teachers said to me, oh, she kept smiling at me and, you know, and it like as if she like was in love with me or something. And I thought, oh, what is wrong with this woman? And she said, um, you know, it's just so lovely what Lydia wrote. And I thought, what? Because, like, you know, I hadn't even read it. Mm. My children have been always been very independent, independent learners, independent at uh, everything, basically. You know, they've, Loretta's the same. Yeah, she's, she's very independent. She's Miss Little Independent. They're all very independent children. And she said, um, she gave me this essay that Lydia wrote and it was about fostering and it was just so absolutely mind-blowing for me to read because she'd wrote all about her experience of being a foster sister all her life. She was 16 at the time when she wrote it. And she put, you know, she she put all the negative things and there's, there's, there's negative things. I'm not going to, you know, say to all of you people listening... It's one, you know, you're going to have down times. You're going to have times where it's going to be really tough. It's a roller coaster of emotions. You know, one minute you're really low, then you're in the middle, then you're really high. It's a roller coaster. But the good times are good times, and the bad times are really bad time. And she wrote, for the hundred negative things I can tell you about fostering, a hundred very negative things I can tell you about fostering, there's a million pure positive ones to replace it. And when I read that, I just thought, I've done something right. I've done something right, you know. And even now, you know, they rely on each other. They rely on their foster siblings. You know, they rely on everyone. And my children are older now. So now I get that help from them. You know, they might go, oh, drop so-and-so around here. I'll take them swimming or, um, you know, I'm... I'm going to for a walk over the forest. I'll take all the kids over the walk for a forest. We're, we are, if the definition of the word is, a massive foster family. So it's not just me as a foster carer. And I don't ever want all the praise for me because it's the whole family yeah. that foster. It's not just me. It's the whole family. And let me tell you, anybody that's thinking about fostering, if you have not got a massive support network around you, forget about it. Mm. Because you need it. But I feel like you're one of these people that wants to help and like save everyone. And then 
when these children come through your door and you you might be privy to the fact that they're going back to an abusive home or something they've told you like that must be very hard when you're in that situation and you feel quite powerless when I went into fostering that's exactly what I felt I felt like I could save the world that's they they were my exact thoughts I thought that's it going to save the world everyone's going to live happily ever after um I'm an optimist by nature. Yeah. That's what I'm like. But we'll just have to go down now. Okay, okay. Bye. And, but, you can't save everyone. And At what point did you realise that on your journey? Uh, you I think probably uh, very soon. <laughs> very soon. <laughs> uh, you can't save everyone. You can do your best. And you could do your best for a day, a week, a year, five years, seven years, 17 years. Whatever time you've had a child, you know, live with you. You can do your utmost best. But in the end, sometimes that's just not enough because the trauma and stress, particularly trauma that these children are subjected to in the early years, mm -hmm. and, you know, we're talking about womb, carrying that baby in a womb, those very early signals we're sending to that child's brain is very, very hard to undo. And there's a very old saying, and it goes back years and years and years. I remember my nan saying it. Give me a boy to his seven and I'll give you the man. Right, so this is what I want to talk about. So a lot of the stuff that... Um I've done and a lot of the self-development stuff, it all, everything strips back to your subconscious is all formed between zero and seven. And I think that's kind of coming to the forefront now and people are probably a lot more aware than you were when you started 20, 30 years ago. You're like, oh, it's a baby. It doesn't know no different. Yeah. And like now you're like, yo, like you've got no idea how these motor neurons have been connected and you're like a sponge. And through your fostering process and having witnessed all of those different children do you think that it gets to an age where you think the damage is so done no matter what you try you can't repair that absolutely but it doesn't mean that they can't go on to have a lovely happy life it's just you know that's made them the person that they are and sometimes they can overcome that I've seen that many a times and sometimes they can't you know it's it, it's it's a really hard subject because as I say, I have witnessed children that have gone through like masses of abuse and also many, many foster homes. So there's been lots of moves as well. And, you know, and you so want to help them, but they've got like this self-destruct button where the trauma just keeps hitting them back. Reappearing. And, and, it, and you know, and it, they just can't make it. They can't make it through. And all you can do at that stage as a foster carer is be there. That's all you can do. Because as long as they know that you love them unconditionally, they will come back and they have come back. And I'm thinking about one child in particular here. I always, always, always hear from him when he's in prison. Don't hear from him any other time. And as soon as he's in prison, I'll get the phone call. Now... To people listening, they may think, what, like, that's terrible. But it's magical because he knows I'm the one person he can ring and I will not have any judgment, judgment at all on him. All I will say is, how are you? Do you need anything? Where are you? Do you want me to come to see you? And then there's some children that I've had that have had as much trauma as him we can't really measure trauma, well, can, can we? We can't really measure what's it. What's the most common thing that you see like that, uh, that puts these children into care? Emotional and physical neglect, which means they're not having any of their needs met from such an early age. So from when that baby comes out, you know, that baby would have come, gone through trauma for nine months, especially if it's alcohol and or drug, drug abuse. abuse. So nine months of trauma and then they... You know, they're born and then none of their needs are met. So, you know, they, we all know if a baby cries, a baby doesn't cry for nothing. You know, a baby cries if they're hungry, you know, if they want to cuddle, if they want that emotional um, 
space that they know. They want to be kept warm, you know, feeding, all of those things. And if you're just totally, you know, not getting any of your needs met from a young age, you, you close down, you shut down, and then you just stop crying. You just stop crying because it's, it doesn't matter if you cry. Cause you cry because no one's coming. No one's coming. And, you know, it's, it's I mean, I, I, I actually love fostering babies. I mean, if I could just have one baby after another, I would be in my element because I think that first year of a child's life if I can put as much as possible into that, and I do, you know, I don't put them down for a year, um, that, you know... Because you don't believe in routine, no. do you? But I went round the house, and so and um, Henry and your granddaughter, Loretta, um, Loretta, are not too... But it's like a couple of months, isn't it, right? Yeah. And me and Lydia are like, no bedtime's having this. And we go around yours and there's like someone on the kitchen table at midnight. Do you know what I'm doing? Like a Michael Jackson dance or something. Do you know? And Lydia was like, my mum doesn't agree in routine. I was like, what would you? But then surely no, for no, you, you need that yeah, respite. No, well. I, it's not. I'm not that bad. Like, I do. I do really. Make sure they're fed, obviously. No, no, <laughs> I have got some kind of routine. Because obviously, especially if they're at school, they've got to go because they've got to be up early yeah. for school and things like that. But going back to a baby, I think, you know, when there's people are so regimented and, you know... I think but, the babies can sense it too. I think my son's sense I think they're it. so regimented, you know, they've got to nap for two hours at this time. I think, oh, they might, they might not be tired at that time. And they've got to eat at this time. I think that I've demand fed all my babies and I've had so many babies. I mean, even over the last five years, I must have had, I don't know, well, one, one five, five babies over the last five years. Um, and... I haven't looked at my, I've never clock. looked at a clock or a watch or my phone at any time with any of them because I can tell, right, I can tell if a whether hungry. they're crying for food, whether they're crying because they're wet or whether they're crying when they're, if they're tired. So, that's so I can tell like so that. So it's so true. We often overrule our instinct. Well, it should like this because they should be fed at this time and they should shit at this time <laughs> and, they, <laughs> and they should have bath at this time. And we get told now and we overrule our instinct. Yeah, right? I think it, when it comes to life, like, we're like, well, it should like this. I should have a partner and I should have a house and I should have two kids and a dog. And then it's like... But it doesn't feel the way it should. No. We override we, our and instinct. That, you know, and the stresses I see young mothers now need for putting perfectionism. themselves so under so much stress because everything isn't going exactly how they want it to go. It just is sad because I just think you're missing those moments. You're stressing because they're not sleeping when they should you're stressing because you can't go out at that time because that's your baby's nap time right they're sleeping the prime i think this is something they're so sleeping they're, yeah. like, you know, they're sleeping your arms yeah. you know? my dad said the same school of thought and i was like no you don't get it i cannot possibly leave what if i'm five minutes late in traffic and i would get so anxious and worked up um but what for but, but the, i think the beautiful thing about you is that you t tend to surrender to life and your situations and Almost that you're quite powerless in everything that you do. Well, I just, like we all are. Do you know what exactly. I mean? And I just think, you know, as long as that baby is loved and cherished beyond belief, then, like, why have you got to have this massive strict routine? I've never, ever, even with my own four children, thought I've got to stay in between 12 and 2 because that's their nap time. Yeah, I would. Never, yeah. ever. You know, if I'm out at Sainsbury's and I think, oh, it's half past one and they're falling asleep in the pram, they're falling asleep in the pram. And what was what would you say your children in response to that have been like? They're flexible, they're irritable because they're tired, they don't know routine. No, I, don't... I mean, I never, ever have a baby that's been irritable because I start, so if you think from birth, that's what they're used to. They're not used to being put in a cot for two hours because that's their nap time. If we're out and they're in their pram and I've got a big blanket, I wrap them all in their blanket and they still do the two hours wherever we are, but they'll be in a pram or, you know, they'll be in my arms or, you know, we'll be at a restaurant and they'll be in a carry cot, wherever. You know, I've never, ever let a baby dictate my life. 
you know, I've just carried on with life. And, you know, when you say, are they flexible? Well, all of my children are very different. There isn't one of them that's the same. They've all got very different personalities. You know, it's that nature-nurture debate, isn't it? They're very, very different. And Lydia has brought Loretta up because the complete opposite yeah. to what I brought Total her opposite. up. I mean, they couldn't be much opposite. And I'm not having a go at Lydia at all and I'm not having a go at any of the mums that decide to do routine, routine, r- yeah. routine. I remember Lydia, like with Loretta, it was very like routine, routine. And she was following someone on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, um, I actually think she's coming on here. Following, Clegg, you, yeah. you know, follow, and that's the way she wanted to do it. But for me, looking in, I was thinking, why would you put yourself under so, so much, much stress? stress? Yeah, my why? dad just said this. Why? why would you do that? Going back to what you just said, if I could have a baby every time, I would, right? So, from what I've been reading online, it's like ever since past eight, no one really wants to adopt, right? Because I imagine people like, well, they're damaged now. You know, like, or whatever, like, and everyone wants that romantic childhood phase. And, like, I've always said since I was young that I would want to adopt, but I want to adopt, a, like, a 14, 15-year-old that's on the periphery of, like, going into <laughs> housing. And my dad is, is like, you're mental. Like, they're, 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 they're so fucked by then. And I'm like, yeah, but I think if you put in the time and the work, and he's like, you're not thinking it through. But it's still something that I will do, and I... Be recorded here now, but I will do before when I. Well, the you, chaos definitely, calms down. you definitely but wouldn't why? be able to adopt a 15 year old. Yeah, okay. Because there'd be so many services linked to that child. So, what age do they get past where they almost become unadoptable? Well, it really depends, really, on. on sort of you know behaviors and what what what's been put into that child you know like the services wrapped around that child but you know i i'm a strong i mean i'm so i fight for uh carers to come forward to foster teenagers all the time i'm always doing articles and i put it up on my instagram and i have podcasts talking about teenage foster carers because we all need, every single one of us, someone to believe in us. That's all you need. You don't really need a lot of ingredients, but you need someone to believe in you. And we're all good at something. There isn't one person in this whole world is not good at nothing. You're all good at something. It could be woodwork. It could be, you know. we um, Or just uh, listening. But listening. It could be flower arranging. It could be dog walking. You know, we're all good at something. And it's up to you as a carer and as a parent, because you're doing the same job, is to find that one thing that they're good at and to be Hone in on it. so proactive in, in you know, helping them because it, it does. It takes one significant person. And actually, that might not be a parent and it might not be a carer, but it takes one significant person to believe in you for you to be successful in whatever you're going to be successful in. Funny enough, you said that. It took one person to believe in me to actually get the balls to do this. And it might yeah, it not was. and it might not be a parent. And it, it might wasn't. not be a carer. It could be a teacher. It could be, I don't know, a, someone at a youth club. It could be someone else's mum that's believed in you. I remember I re- watched this documentary, I mean, years ago, and I can't think of his name. And I watched this talk and I was like, so like, oh my God. And it was, it was, he was in America and he was, it was like really like in the poverty of America. And his mum was a, a drug addict. He didn't know his dad. And he used to sit on the church steps every day. And he'd be listening on the church steps to them singing and choir and playing instruments. And one day the vicar opened the door and he said, you've been sitting on this step for months now. Why don't you come in? He said, no. A couple of months later, he asked him again. A couple of months later, he asked him. And in the end, he got this young boy, he was like seven, six or seven at the time, who used to sit there to escape his life at home. He got him in and he got him playing the trumpet. And he'd become one of the most famous trumpet players in the world. Now, if that vicar hadn't opened his door and said, please come into my church, what would have happened to him? Yeah. 
And I think this goes back to that conversation of nature over nurture. And a lot of the time the abuse, abused, like the abused become abusive. abusive. So it's like if it would either, you ever go one way and like identify that that was totally wrong and you should have been sexually abused or domestically abused, or you're like, this is normal. So I'm going to carry on to do that. When you see some of the children come through your door, this is a bit of a topical question. Do you think that there are some children that are like born bad? Absolutely have- not. I can answer that without even thinking about it. I don't think anyone's born bad. I think... We're all born with opportunities and we're all born with the same makeup. You know, we've got a brain, we believe, we've got a heart, we've got lungs, you know, we've all brought... And it's what life puts into it. It's like, you know, if you if you plant a seed and you put it in your window of your home, actually you forget to water it, it's never going to survive. If you plant a seed but you water it every day but there's no window to let the sunlight in, it's never going to survive. But if you plant that seed on your windowsill and you water it every day and talk to it and, you know, have a little chat and nurture it, it's going to grow into a beautiful flower. And we're exactly <coughs> the same. We all need watering. We all need sunlight and we all need worshipping. And that's what I said, you know, everyone, even me, like what you said, even you, I, we all need that yearning for someone to believe in us. Yeah, everyone. And, you know, I was very, very fortunate that I had the best dad in the whole universe. And my dad, I couldn't do anything wrong. So whatever uh, trouble I was in, and I was always in trouble. You, you, might, your fault. you might not believe it, <laughs> Brogan, but I was never in trouble. You know, I mean, I was a middle child. I like, uh, I was, I ha- you know, I rowed with my mum every day. And my dad was a gambler. You know, I didn't have an easy childhood. I was born in the East End. I didn't have an easy childhood at all. But do you know what? Whatever I'd done, my dad said I was right. So how important was your childhood to give you the skill set for you to foster? I think, Brogan, everything in my childhood led me to foster. So my dad was um, an Italian um, immigrant um, who came over to... um, he, He... he, he was from a tiny little village in southern Italy and ended up in the east end of Hackney. I won't go into details, but that's like, he ended up in Hackney at the age of 11, couldn't speak a word of English. So he, listen, something you already did and you're like, he didn't really fit anywhere. Because there he was Italian and here, sorry, in England he was Italian and there he was an yeah, Englishman. Yeah, so he, he came over to live with his mum at the time and actually... He didn't know he didn't know it was his mum. He thought it was his sister, but she he was the illegitimate child of, of the old. There was twelve of them. Very so, Jeremy Carl, so, isn't it? Yeah, he was. I mean, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. You couldn't write it. He was the illegitimate <sighs> child of the eldest daughter of twelve children. So he so he was brought up as the youngest, and uh, you know his nan who died. He thought it was mum, and then he was sent by his uncles and aunts to England. He hated England. He hated his mum. He hated his stepfather. He married my mum very young. My mum was 17. He was 18. Oh, wow. And um, he just he just always was haunted, my dad. He never felt like he really fitted in anywhere. And I was like his, like, I, I, you know, I was his life. Do you know what I mean? Like, if he didn't have me, I don't know what he'd have done because he always knew he had to come home because he's got me. And purpose. When he, yeah, he had a purpose in life. He's got two other children, but I was just... The favourite. My dad, my dad, my dad, my dad. And whenever he used to leave my mum, my carrier bag would be put in my hand and I'd go off with my dad. So I think from a very young age, all I wanted to do was fix my dad. And it was like... Oh, I've got a fixed dad, you know, I've got, oh, where's dad? He's not picked me up from school. And I, I always wanted to fix him. I wanted to make him happy. And looking back, I mean, my dad's died now, but looking back, he never really was happy. Like, I never saw him really happy. So, you know, from being very young and, and wanting to fix somebody all my life, I then went into... Carried that with you to fixing everyone else. <laughs> like you said, you wanted to save everyone. <laughs> so it's it's from a very... Has it been very... a cost for you, though? No, because I've loved doing it. And I think 
you never foster, never do anything in life. That you don't want to do. That you don't want to do. And I'm a very strong-minded person. No. <laughs> no. I'm a very so you're really well behaved <laughs> and not and strong-minded. No so I, I wouldn't do anything unless I loved doing it and I'm passionate about it. So that's what I say. If I ever hear anybody moaning about anything i'm not very tolerant either but i think well no one's got a gun to your head that you've got to do that yeah like someone said to me um once you're not a tree you're not stuck <laughs> and he's like oh no i'm not a tree i can move <laughs> yeah so i i think and that's what i teach all my children i teach all of them don't do anything that you're unhappy doing do it because you're happy doing it you know and it could be but i, I you know I'm not money motivated at all. I've tried to bring my children up to not be money motivated. If they want to go out and do so that it pays them £10 a day, but actually they're really happy doing it, I'm, over, your boots. I'm over at the moon with them. Talking you know. about money, yeah. it's not very well paid, the fostering, is it? Or like, well, Did yeah. it end up costing you? Because I was reading something. No, the other day, you did no. like four prams, all these days no, out, no, the food. No, that's, it must be like five trolleys every no, time you go around yeah, Sainsbury's. It, it, no, you get, an, it, you get an allowance. So you get a fostering allowance. So you're not taxed on that. It's a fostering allowance. And it's broken down. So it's broken down as in school uniforms, school trips, petrol... Uh, it gets broken down. And for me, like, it, it's always been enough. And if there's any money left but over, I always save it for their holidays. So, like, if there's flights to Italy or I've got to take them somewhere so they have money over, they can all, always put a little bit of money in their Mr Henry for savings. Uh, so, no. I mean... But no, it's not got... enough for you to have a wage? No, no, it's not so enough. So you to... have to be able to be reasonably comfortable to well, do this. Well, when I say it's not enough for you to have a well, wage, to not, not go to you work. get an allowance and then you get a, uh, a you get another amount. I mean, it's only a hundred and something pound a week or something, but it depends on how much training you do. Like, so if you put yourself forward, because there's level one, two, and three for training, so you, you keep training and doing things like. Uh, um, trauma-based, uh, nurturing-based, um, art therapy. So you have know. you got a special type of therapy qualification to be able to do what you do? Um, yes, it's called life. Yeah, that's <laughs> what I'm saying. Because some of it it's is so called, by the book. It's called life. And do you know what? And this is the honest truth, Brogan, because there's a massive amount in social services. There's CAMS, which is very, like, for children with um, specific, needs as in mental health needs and stuff and then there's therapists within social services so there'll be a section of therapists that you can access if you need them but for me I think the most important thing about childhood is childhood right childhood, childhood. going back right so your daughter was on one of the biggest reality show yeah that's a bit that can be traumatic or very um, traumatic. Especially the first one. You've got James, who's like the most unreliable, up, down and then, person. Uh, like, and then, were you not sitting there thinking, what the fuck are you doing? No. Were you, what, what, what were you thinking when all this madness is going on and then all well, of a sudden you're like, no one knew who you were and then all of us... Was that hard for the children in the house as well? No, because the children... I, I never... Had to, it was very separate. So if I filmed, I always filmed when the children wasn't there. So the children... Any of the children in care were never there when the film crew come in. If I was filming outside the home and I wasn't there when they come home from school, Dave was there. So, there, yeah. you know, there was always someone there to uh, put dinner on before. It was chaos, as in I didn't have, I haven't got enough time anyway, but, like, you know, making sure that like, I, I got to a place at a certain time then I had two hours filming and stuff. But I made it work. And do you know what? I made it work and I enjoyed every single minute of it because it was about Debbie. And I thought, oh, my God, it's not been about me I for years. I you never expected that, though. I thought, like, if I'd have said to you 10, I 15 thought, get years ago... I've never had my hair done in my life. <laughs> Put makeup on. Makeup. I'm a warm-up. Don't get time to wear makeup. So... All of a sudden, it was like, oh, my God, this is actually about me again. And people were interested in you naturally. And I think the beauty about you is you're so unapologetically you in all situations and like with all people that you meet. And I think the nation ca 
caught on to that, right? Well, it's about honesty, isn't it? Yeah. And I'm, all of my children forever shouting at me because they're always going, I mean, Mom, all of them. why would you say that? All, all of them. Why would you say that? <laughs> why would you say that? I mean, have you got no filter? What is wrong with you? Well, when we went to film, Lid when I said to Lydia when we were at James's birthday, she went, I don't think this is a good idea because she's like, two people with ADHD in a camera group. She went, I just... I mean, there's some videos of us dancing somewhere. She's like, I just don't think it'd be a very good idea. I just don't know what might come out your mouth. No, I know. <laughs> and of course, I had masses of abuse, Brogan, because everyone couldn't understand why I was still, you know... Helping James because yeah. he'd done so much to Lydia over the years. So I was getting mm. like, well, she's your daughter. Like, why are you sticking up for him? I never, ever stuck up for James. And let me tell you, I've had more rows with James than I've had hot dinners. I mean, he's run from me. Do you know what I mean, he hides in the house and stuff if he sees me coming down the road because he only lives around the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But there's something in James that we all know is wonderful and he's got a great big heart. And let me tell you, with the fostering, he has been an incredible foster brother. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So he's helped a lot of the children that I've had come through my home. And again, you know, does it kick back to me wanting to fix him? This because, is what I was going to ask. Do you know what I mean? Like, I tried everything to fix him. Do you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I've followed him. I screamed at him, you know, I, I went to rehabs to visit him. You know, he had one addiction after the other. And yesterday there was 12 of us around my table and James was there for Sunday dinner. And I look and I think, you know, he's in an extremely good place now. Yeah. And he's in an extremely good place now and doing very well for himself. Do you know why? Because he had so many people that believed in him, you know, not even just, when he didn't believe in himself. Not just us, the Brights, as a family, who have supported him through thick and thin. I mean, don't forget, I knew James when he was seventeen, eighteen. He's thirty-five now. Thirty-six, I think. Thirty-five, thirty-six. But you know, he's got an incredible family, and his mum and dad have always, always championed him and been there for him, and you know. That makes me sad as well because I think of all the kids that haven't got that and they do go down the wrong road and they do get into drug addiction and alcohol and end up homeless because they've not got that one person or, I mean, James didn't have one. He had about 20 people that were all rallying around him the whole time. And I often say to him, you are the luckiest person in the world because not only do we love you as the brights and your family love you. The nation loves you. The whole them, bloody nation loves you. <laughs> Which him. is like, he's done so much. <laughs> like, how many guys could go on and break a girl's heart and they're like, oh, but we still love him. He's hard, he's allowed to wave it. I mean, he's on loose women. <laughs> but you must have, what you watched that unfold when he came through your door when he wasn't known and he was your daughter's boyfriend. And then you watched the addiction, the exposure. I mean, Listen, they were the first reality show yeah. in the UK. They got unprecedented amount of attention, right? Mm. Do, how much of that do you think was a direct response to him being on national television? Um, do you know what? I can't really answer that, Brogan, because I feel that, yeah, I think it did have some kind of massive impact on him because he went from being James who worked in a jewellery shop down Walthamstow Market to like being on like the front of every magazine, newspaper. He had girls frying themselves at him and one, you know, everybody wanted a bit of James, didn't they? Everybody. Um, and can a person really deal with that at such a young age? And I think if you, anyone, if you've got an insecurity and then it's put under a microscope for people to be subject to their judgment and stuff, it's going to expose. Yeah, I mean... I never, and I've, you know, Lydia's only just developed this, let me tell you. But I've never really worried. I don't, I was going to say care then, but I'm going to use the word worried because care, when you say I don't care, I think it sounds, I don't like that. So I'm going to change the word from I don't care to I've never worried about what anyone thinks about me. Never. So if people go, oh, I can't stand her. I go, oh, okay, it doesn't bother me. Or if, you know, I was 
But I, not I, a lot I of people have that confidence. No, and, and Lydia, and definitely, Lydia definitely didn't. She used to worry about what everyone was thinking and talking about. Her. And, you know, first of all, I thought, on that, you know, I think, well, maybe, you know, I'm a grown woman now and with age comes wisdom. And, you know, I've developed that. But I can be totally honest with you, Brogan. I look back in my life and I've never worried about what people thought but about isn't me. isn't that remarkable? And a lot of the people who've come on here, it's just that amount of resilience and it's like... No, I don't... I think I one don't. of the things I learned this year is that no one's looking at you the way you are judging yourself. And I think all of this stuff online and like makes everyone feel like some kind of mini celebrity. Like, I've got to put this up. And I'm guilty of it before. Like, oh, I've got to look nice in this one. Henry took a picture of me the other day on my phone. I look like a toad. <laughs> I'm going to send you it, Dev. I look like an actual toad. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> and we're like, we feel like, like everyone's watching us and judging us. Like I had like, even when it came to doing this, like so much self-doubt, like I filmed it all and I was like, oh, I don't need to prove nothing to no one. I don't need to post it now. But actually that was my fear of like, fuck, what are people going to say? Because it's like the yeah, first but, time but, in my life but, I've been me. What you have to do is you have to, and I, I, that's what I'm saying. If I look back, I think, God, I've never worried. It hasn't bothered me. Like, and I think you have to love yourself. And uh, that's not in a vain way. So I'm not saying that in a vain no. way. But what I'm saying is, as long as I know that I'm a nice person, as long as I know that I've done everything I can not to hurt people and just to help people, as long as I know that um, I'm going to die one day, I know I'm going to die one day, but we're all going to die one day. And actually, when I die, I've left a little bit of a legacy and Hopefully it spoke for about for many, many years. But even if it spoke about well, it's for the five ripple years, effect to your legacy it's a as ripple well. Ripple effect. That I want people to sit around and go, do, you know, do you remember Mum or do you remember Debbie? Oh God, well, didn't, think, she, didn't she say this or didn't she? But but I think by you being yourself, Debbie, you pave a way for everyone else or the children underneath you just to be unapologetically themselves. Yeah. It's like when we see parents or figureheads, like for example, like I don't want to slag them off, right? The Kardashians, yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, you probably don't. But Khloe Kardashian had a massive lawsuit because somebody put up an unfiltered picture of you, her. But you're someone's mum, and you also not in that. You, there's there's an army like 350 million people that are looking at you, and you're showing you we should be human, and we Absolutely. don't embrace that anymore. And if I want to cry, I cry. I mean, sometimes the kids are at the table, and like something might really upset me, and I kind of. You're right, go, yeah, I'm all right, I'm just crying. It's good to cry. It just is. cry, you know, cry. And, you know, and we all don't look our best all the time. And it doesn't bother I'll get me. My toad picture up. It doesn't bother me at all, you know, like, and then, you know, sometimes Lydia or Georgia or Freddie might go, Mom, look at that, it's terrible, that picture. I mean, they laugh at me, <laughs> and I go, Why are you laughing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> what are you laughing at? But you've got to laugh at yourself. Oh. You've got to have humour yourself. And as long as you know that you are a good person... Well, it's like, like you said, no one's getting out of it lies. So we might as well make fun out of it right. along the way. As long as you know you're a good person and the most important thing is that you're kind, then nothing else matters. doesn't matter what anyone's got to say about you. You, you live life how you want to live it. And hopefully, not just my children, that's what I've taught all the children to, you know, that have been fostered. You. And the young, the, the longest, one of the longest children that I've had in care, he came into care on a short-term basis. And 18 years later, he's still with me, right? He, well, he's 20 now, but he's just got allocated a flat. And, you know, I've gone through... Hell and back with this child. Hell and back. I mean, I could be on here for another seven hours and tell you <laughs> what I've been about him. <laughs> right, just talking about him. I mean, there isn't anything that he didn't do that was wrong. I mean, going from drugs to police to stealing to driving cars without a licence. I mean, he's done everything, right? Sounds like one of my ex-boyfriends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that red flag sounds like fun. <laughs> and... You know, but he knew, it didn't matter how much I shouted and screamed and cried and said, that's it, you know. He knew that at the end of the day, I weren't going to give up on him. And the other day, me and him got in the car, so he's just passed his driving test. 
He's just got a flat and we got in the car and we sang Fast Cars all the way home from his flat. Tracy Chapman. Me and I him. love that <laughs> song. And, we sing, and I looked around and I thought, oh my God. Oh, but you could have just cried. I, I thought, oh my God, I've gone all through this and he's driving me now. I feel like driving Miss Daisy. Like I'm sitting in the front of the car and we're singing together. And I thought... We finally got there. Every moment was we worth it. Moment, absolutely. And I think I put that on Instagram. Life comes in moments and you have to grab them when you can. And that was a moment. And you That know, will live with you forever. Yeah, it will. And I'd sent him afterwards, Tracy Chapman's... Fast car. Yeah, I'd sent him the video of it that, that you know, he, he's she's got all of this back on tonight, number one. And I went, um, this will always be our song. And that's what I put at the end of it. This will always be our song. And he just put a smiley face and a heart and sent it back. Their moments. And I'm sure he's going to get in trouble again. Yeah, and you don't want to pull but his hair off. You're going to drive the car off a cliff. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure there's loads more to come. But that is fostering. Yeah, that's what I'm... Yeah. Fostering is for I want to touch on something you just said. There's like... So when I first started this, it actually was um, four episodes with me and my therapist. And one of them was called like, Learning to Love Yourself. And one of the questions I posed to her is like, because for some, for some children that can feel, or people, so grandiose can remove, like, I don't even know how to like myself. I've never given myself a kind thought. Or children who witnessed not even healthy relationships. It's like... So they have this lack of value. You must have children come through your home that, like this lack of self-worth, this lack of value. Like, How do you start implementing those stepping stones to the children to start believing in themselves? Well, I've actually just started, funny you should say this, because I've also got an, another job as well as everything else. So I'm actually called... You're making me feel... You, do you know what I said to my mate you were coming on and she went, oh my God, she makes me feel like a bad human being. <laughs> like you make me feel even more tired. You make me feel like I'm not doing enough. So I'm a hub carer. Oh, Jesus. So a hub carer means that you're allocated to... Well, I've got 14 foster carers that I look after. And... um. Has he done a poo? No, he's done away. No. That, so We're keeping it authentic. <laughs> Go um, on so, um, yeah, so I'm, I look after 14 other foster carers and all the children in the hub. So, for example, this weekend, so what happens is I look after all the children if they're going away a weekend or a week or they just want a day off or they've got, got a hospital appointment or their mum's not well there's all kinds of reasons so I look after all of them when that happens so the positive thing about that is they're always coming to me so they're not going to strangers so it's not like because you have to be police checked to look after a child in care so they're not going to strangers so I'm like the favourite nan you know they'll go oh yeah we're going to Debbie's because they come to me and like they can have Nutella and oh. like, they can have everything so and, literally you know, have a breakdown <laughs> And they absolutely love it. But the most positive thing of that is they all see each other. So I took 21 ice skating this Sunday. So I took 21 children ice skating. They're all in the same. So they're from 5 to 16. They all know they're in foster care. Now, children in foster care at school very rarely talk about foster care because they don't shame. want to be. Yet yeah, shame. They don't want to be seen as different. They don't want people knowing, like, because then they go, why are you in foster care? Can't your mum look after you? I no mean, one loves you. Children, children are cruel. Children are cruel. So, so they don't talk about it mainly at school. Now, for the first time, these 21 children all know they're in care, all know that they're not living with their mum and dads. They have such a strong bond, all of them. And I've just started, I've just written up a course, and it's called Finding the, Mrs. P Finding the Missing Pieces. So... I've given all the foster carers these books. They're like log books. And when we talk about therapy, my children don't want to go and talk to a therapist for an hour. It's too weighted. Too Looking heavy. at a clock, drawing a picture. and I think it's not. I, I'm not saying I'm against therapy. What I'm saying is do it when you're an adult. Do it when you've got that ability to take it well, on. I think there's something about like it, when you're in, in the middle of the process and then going through the process. Yeah, yeah, I mean, childhood is a very small part of our lives, isn't it? So just be a kid. Just be a child. Process so, it after. So what I've been trying to tell the foster carers, so you can only be a hub carer if you've got experience, is hands-on. 
find the missing pieces. So I'm developing a program at the moment where all of these foster carers, they can only choose one child to do it because it's very intimate. So if they've got three children, they have to pick out the child that they want to do this with. And it's very intimate. It's about them having just two hours a week of just their time. And it could be baking a cake, watching a movie together, um, drawing a picture, writing a poem about each other, um, writing a letter about what they th love about you and you writing a letter about what you love about them, photographs, doing photographs. So this, so it's still an expressive outlet, though. It's just not through physical words and therapy and that clinical approach of being sat somewhere. Absolutely. Because that's highlighting it, even more that there's something wrong, wrong with them. Because why is no one else in the class <laughs> doing that? Absolutely. So it's called on hands-on therapy. So it's very practical work and it's very reflective work because after each of these activities that these foster carers will be doing with the child, they will actually reflect on how they felt when they was doing it. And also the child is going to reflect how they felt being with the foster carer in that, pe that place. Because when these children come into care, like what you said earlier, there's so many missing pieces. You know, they've not had that nurturing. They've not had that one-to-one. -one. They've never baked a cake with somebody. I mean, there's nothing more lovely than doing the ingredients. Well, the experience, and, and then it? I said, at the end of baking your cake, you have to sit down, make a pot of tea, and have a piece of cake and a cup of tea with that child. Now, how is that going to make them feel? Does it make them feel? It may make them feel comfortable. We're all assuming that they're going to love that, but it may make them feel comfortable. Why is that making... But why are you sitting down and cutting the cake and having the tea once they've made it? You're giving them work. Yeah, yeah. self -work. It's not like, oh, that was crap. There it goes in the bin. Absolutely. So it's like, I want to almost stop what you're saying there. It's like, okay, I've made a cake with someone, but let's... Because normally, and I'm guilty of that as a parent. Oh, I made the cake and he puts them out, Deb, and he's like, literally, I look at it and I think, <laughs> I wouldn't feed it to a dead dog, yeah? <laughs> and I, <laughs> you've always like, oh, that will go in the bin. But it's so true what you're saying. Like, it, we've got to give it worth and you sit down and I think everything that you've said to me today is about putting a lot of time into children yeah and I think we live in a generation and a space where we're all run out of time there's not enough hours in the day and absolutely and you can't buy time no and you can't get time back once it's gone it's gone so I've just started this so I gave them their books after after ice skating yesterday I gave them their books out and then I said their first their first port of call is they have to design the front page of their books. So it's got to be a joint thing with them and the foster care, and they've got to design the front of their book. And what Again, they... time, experience, and giving them an outlet. Yeah. That's the key things that I feel that... Yeah, so the foster care might go, right, my favourite flower, like I've got to do it with one of the children I've got in care as well. So I'm doing it. It's part of my journey as well, so I'm going to do it with them. So I'm going to draw a sunflower. The first thing I'm going to do is draw a sunflower on the front of their book. And I'm going to say, sunflowers are my favourite flower. They know something about me. Then they will say, I go, what do you want to draw? So they draw something and they tell me why they've drawn it. Then so it's like that disarmouring. Yeah, it's about... Getting them to feel safe. Yeah, and, and it's, about, it's about getting to know each other. Because as you say, we all live in a world of fastness. Fastness. And little snippets of information, like what I said, I could empty a box of a puzzle out on this table. This is what you've got to think of. This is why I've named it Finding the Missing Puzzle Pieces. So I could tip the, the, the whole puzzle and, you know, there might be the whole middle section that's missing. So it makes no sense at all. So for me, my job as a foster carer and my foster carers is to find those missing pieces. And there... It, it, it goes both ways because that foster child will then find out so much about you that you've never had time to sit and talk about. I mean, you've never had time to talk but about. But I think it's that connectedness, I think, in a world where we can be so connected, we're the most disconnected we've ever been. Yeah, absolutely. So, And like, how easy is it for the children to use their phones as an escapism but come in your house and actually want to sit there and play whatever, Minecraft or whatever it is, or message their mates? It's... It's so hard. Oh, well, that's my... I mean, when we talk about phones, I mean, that's my pet hate. And I've put down... And one of the things when I've talked about this new course that they're all going to go on, it's going to be over a year as well. It's not a short course. It's a year course. Is that the phones have to be put away. 
I mean, and I think that's for any parent. I mean, the phones have to be put away. They can't even be on the table. You know, the phones are good. You're not going to look at a recipe on the phone. You're going to get a cookbook and look for a recipe. How archaic is that? Right, exactly. <laughs> Blow off the cobwebs. <laughs> so get a cookbook. Even if you go to the library, there we are. Visit yeah. a library. Getting more of an experience. Visit a library. Go to the library. Get a cookbook. Choose a cake you both want to do. It's not cake you want to do, or it's not a cake. Why? Why would you choose that cake? So they might say Victoria sponge. A big thing you could say. Why have you chosen a Victoria sponge? How would that describe you? They might go, oh, because it's got a lovely bit in the middle. I don't know what they're going to answer. I like double cream. But it's, it's very. It's going to be a very reflective book. So then, by the end of the year, all of us foster care is going to get together with the children, share our books, which is a year's journey of finding the missing puzzle, right, and all have a meal together. Wow. So those children will also get to know that they're well, on I think the any parent could benefit from this Absolutely. as well. Absolutely, you know I mean? absolutely. And that's what I say, you know, I, when I first started fostering, I thought, do you know what? If you're a really good parent, you're going to be a fantastic foster parent. Absolute rubbish. It's the other way around. If you're a good foster parent, you're going to be a brilliant parent. Because you push yourself out of just the normal parenting things. You know, we all get into this mode. And I remember doing it. Please, like, don't, all you mums out there, don't think I'm judging you. I've done it. Every club that you can think of after school. Dance club. Um, ballet. Swimming club. So pick them up from school. We get in the car, rush and go. Your bag in the car, rush them to another club. Get in the thing, you're late, you've got to get changed. Go into the, another club, get, out of the, get home. Right, right, everything's rushed, right? They don't want that. They'd rather you pick them up and go for a hot chocolate and a cup of tea. Or they'd rather you pick them up and take them for a walk through a forest and pick up like some But we foraging. have this checklist of things as a parent yeah. that we feel that we have to do. And we're comparing ourselves to what everyone else is doing and what you see online. So I look up and I'm like, oh my God, they've made their dinner, their <laughs> lunch, their snacks. And I'm hanging on to adult life by a thread. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are some days where I'm like, how? How are you doing this? <laughs> and it's like you don't see all the stuff that's behind the scenes. And I think it's like everything that you've said today is just go back to that connectedness. Go like, back to being connected. Go back eat to... Eat the crap cake. Have the tea. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas I'm like, no. like I'm like, no, listen, I want you to express yourself. But that ball ball does not go on that Christmas tree, <laughs> on that bit of the tree. And like Harry will come along. I'm like, yeah, yeah, you do you, but over there. <laughs> not in the way of this Christmas tree. <laughs> do you know what I mean? But how many parents do that? I mean, I see it on Instagram and I think, I look at their homes. I, I, I look at their homes. I'm not going to say any names, but I look at them. Yeah, all the pillars are on the settee. Like, they've got children. There's not a toy in the room. And I think, oh, So what? I used to feed Henry what? in a raincoat. I thought, well, what the hell is going on? Like, where's where's the toys? Like, where, why are they not jumping up and down on the settee <laughs> and frying the cushion? I mean, my kids love the settee as a trampoline. Use it as a trampoline. <laughs> but, what, what? Put the cushions in front. Do a slide. Like, yeah, like, you know, just, just do it all. Like, just... Let your home Explore. be their home. You know, it, look, it, why would you spend all the time having all your ornaments all straight? I mean, my it's, you're making my palms sweat. <laughs> like, are we going to go home and is it going to, am I going to let him use it a trampoline tonight? Or like, you know. If you would have seen him, I shit you not, I feed him in a raincoat, yeah? <laughs> And the first time I took him to the park... In a raincoat? In a raincoat was a mess. So he'd be in, his, uh, in a raincoat. No. Yeah, no, listen. That's so child the abuse. The first time he went to the park, <laughs> like, he fell over and he went... Ah! Mummy, miss! And he's two, yeah? And I thought, oh, my God, what am I doing No, to no, like, that, Literally, do what you know, am I do doing? Do you know what? That is so wrong. <laughs> and I have... No, I have yeah, some so like, kids... I've had to really I have some children come to me from foster care and they I go, can you put their wellies in the bag because I'm going to take them over the forest because I right, live right near yeah. Narton Forest. I mean, you, you like the mud's up to your knees. Can you make sure they've got their willies because they're coming to me for the weekend? And I get the willies out and they're not worn. They're brand new. Like, they're, they're like, you can see they've never been used. I think, 
well, why would you have Wellingtons if you don't use them? Like mine have got holes in, so it yeah. seeps through to their socks. So they can, even their socks are muddy when they come home. Aww. You know, the main thing is they're children. Let them be children. I mean, if you come home, I've had the time before where we've been out and they're absolutely covered in mud. And I think, oh, God, they're covered in mud, you know, little bin of, and it's late and they're tired. And I think, oh, no, I'll put them to bed like that. I'll bath them in the morning. It doesn't matter. You, I can see it's you. making me sweat. I can see you hyperventilating. Yeah. I'm not going to make them cry and get in there. Uh, you know, another thing, right, so ch some children come into care, they won't bath. They won't bath. They so won't not wash. Used to bathing, or? They won't bath. Yeah, they're allergic to water. They just will not bath. Like you can run the bath, you can use lush bombs in it. You can have any any products. You can get all these products for that child. They will not bath. Now, what do you do? What would you Wipe do? Off. Just give them a packet of baby wipes. When they when you they feel comfortable. I think, I think one of the things I've learned as a parent as well. Um, it's like in their time, and I hate saying yeah. that, but it really is like, in their time. well, I'm going to wrestle you in the bath, probably get done for social services <laughs> for, like, killing you because I want my house spotless. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh, you've got to learn to pick your battles. You choose your battles wisely. That's exactly what I say. And, I, you know, uh, if they don't want to get in the bath, I'm not going to be going, no, come on, you've got to get in the bath. You're not going to get into bed. Like, you've got clean pyjamas, you've got clean sheets and everything. I'm not doing it. Like when they're ready, they oh. will get in the bath. But yeah, I'm not, not in my house. Right. <laughs> right. Let's just a couple of reflective stuff. If you could say, if you had the power to change some stuff in the care system, what would you change? Like what needs fixing? Because I know that we're completely inundated. Yeah. And yeah what, I, where do you think it's broken? Or how many places? Is it I mean, it, you know, there's. I've read so many books over the years and I've had so many different experiences. And, you know, people often say the care system's got to change. All the children that have been in the care system then read, write books and the care, because this is what I've had to go through. It's been the same for like many years and years. I mean, 32 years I've been doing it and there has been lots, masses of changes over the 32 years, but they still want change. And so... When you say for me, if I had to pinpoint, I think definitely not all children are fosterable. And there's some children that are so damaged that they go into residential care. And I think residential care should have such an overhaul because most of the children that I know end up in residential care, you know, it's horrible because pe basically people have given up on them and it doesn't yeah. mean to say that they're not trying their best in some of these residential homes because I'm sure that they are but it's a home you haven't got that one-to-one -one basis like what you were saying about time there's a changeover of staff people leave there's not con no consistency you know so basically they're in a room on their own whereas if they're in a home they would be checked up on all the time. And it is hard. I'm not saying it's not hard. But you've got to have one significant person that believes in you, not 20, because that's not you're not going to get anywhere. It's Too got, diluted. It, yeah, you've got to have one. So I think the changes, there's been masses of changes and, uh, and there's been some really good changes. I think we've come a long, long way from... Uh, children leaving 16 and feeling totally abandoned. That's been increased to 25 now if they're at uni I mean, and studying. That's a significant difference. Massive difference. 21, if they're, um, you know, still in care at 21, they get help. Um, 18, they can leave foster care, but they go into supporting lodgings. But that's they're very small supporting lodgings, so there might only be three or four children in it, which is another massive asset. And that prepares them for housing. And, you know, they go priority for looking at a flat. They've, you know, two of mine have got really lovely council flats now, you know, and they're on the, they've got their own homes and their front doors. Mm. You know, they get a, um, an allowance to help them with, like, bedding or a washing machine or stuff like that, 
we've come on leaps and bounds and I'm very proud how much we have come on. So I'm not really a negative person that I'm going to sit here and go, they've got to change this, they've got to change that. Because I think social services have done incredible in acting on behalf of the children to ensure they get a better life. There's some local authorities that you don't have to pay council tax if you're a looked after child till you're over 25, you know, and that helps with their bills. So there's lots and lots of help that they're getting. I think if you ask for change, I think that's got to be directed much more to the courts and not to social services because I feel like the courts have a lot to answer for with judges being so out of touch with what's going on because social services may uh, put in a referral for an assessment and a full care order for a child and they may have done all the work saying this child isn't safe there at home and the judge will say that child can go home. So if you were not working closely together or not? I just feel they're out of touch. I think a lot of the judges are out of touch with what's actually going on in this world. And there's a lot of work that goes into... People think children are just taken into care. No. Absolutely not, right? Let me tell you, it takes masses and masses of evidence for a judge to say social services can have a full care order. And do you order. think that almost takes too long? Sometimes. I think it takes too long. There's interim care orders and care orders. I think it takes too long. And I think all this time, you know, these poor social workers, because they're under a lot of pressure, will do so much work to keep that child safe. And the judges will just say they've got to go home to their parents or their mum or their dad or, you know, whoever is in their care. And... To get to that stage where they've gone to court to get a care order, surely a judge must say, God, like, you know, if it's got to this stage, what can I do to help? Yeah. So the so difference, I think what we need to point out is at the courts and not at social services about decision making. Okay. Um, how do you want to be remembered? How do I want to be remembered? I'd like to be remembered as a sunflower. You know, and always keeping my face towards the sun. Um, because no matter how low things are at times, this goes to everybody, it will get better. And I think life is about challenges and learning from them. And you must always continue to yearn to learn and, and help people and, you know, and be creative in your way of thinking so how I'd like to be remembered is mad, nutty, Debbie with the hair. <laughs> the hair and the <laughs> lipstick. And what does life look like for Debbie when the fostering stops? I mean, like, you're no spring chicken anymore. You've got all these kids. <laughs> Bloody true. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm going. I, I struggle with the one up all night and you're like, give me more babies. I'm like, she's off her head. I want what she's <laughs> smoking. <laughs> Joking. <laughs> but what I'm saying is like, there must you and Dave must have sat down and had a conversation like, oh, we've only got a couple more years left to us. Or like we literally, you know, t taking the children in the hospital with you on your last days. I, I, when I does think, it stop? I what? think I think I often get asked this as well. I think the day that I wake up and I think I don't want to do this anymore, I will stop. The day I get up and I don't get joy out of my day, it will stop. But as long as I've got breath in me and the energy to keep going. I'm going to keep going. Well, you're spreading that hope as well. Um, we did touch on it, but um, you had quite a, um, an accidental fall into the foster care. But to that lady sitting in, to you, to young Debbie sitting in that restaurant completely unaware of the road that you were about to take, yeah. if I could throw you back in a time warp, what would you say to her? I'd say thank you from the bottom of my heart because I feel... <laughs> I feel like like what I said to you, I think that was my journey, wasn't it? That you. actually was my journey. And, um, and I preach this to all my children and I'd preach this to you, to strangers and everything. With every opportunity and door that's open, take it. Because you never know where it's going to lead. The other thing is, even if you walk through that door and you grab that opportunity by the scruff of its neck and it doesn't work out you haven't lost anything 
You only lose that if you haven't tried. And I think what's so interesting, sometimes we spend, and I can speak for myself, so long pushing on the door that's closed that you don't see the doors that are open. open. And like those opportunities. But if you'd have given yourself one piece of advice embarking on this foster journey to you back then, what would you have said to yourself? Keep smiling. Keep smiling. The gritted teeth. Like keep <laughs> smiling kids. because I do believe that was my destiny and I do believe that everything in life happens for a reason and when you're going through really tough, hard times, you can't work out why you're going through them but a few years later you think, oh, I needed to go through that because I've ended up like this. So I think... I always say to myself when I'm stuck um, and there was a few times the last few years because... I split up with Henry's dad and I thought, it's not meant to look like I'm, it's not meant to be here. And the biggest thing that's kept me going is like, you're exactly where you're meant to be. Yeah. Like for whatever reason, I, I remember there was one point I just had to write that like 10 times a day. Like whatever it is, like you're exactly where you're meant to be. And I think more often than not, our breakdowns become our breakthroughs. And I think we get so caught up in life, don't we? Like, oh, it's not meant to be uncomfortable. Everyone's on their picket white fence and they're all together. And, uh, but it's, that's not true. No. And I think the more we surrender to, like, this shit's going to hit the fan. Absolutely. And the more we surrender to pushing ourselves out of our comfort zones, because it, that, again, we can be so easy getting in a comfort zone where it's easy, you know, like you're in a job, like you're earning a little, you're earning money, you get a bigger house, like, and you don't want to do that because you're uncomfortable with it. But we learn nothing about ourselves in our comfort zone. We only learn about ourselves when we're challenged with things that are totally out of our comfort zone. And that makes us grow. Well, Debbie Bright, it has been an honour and a privilege. Thank you. Thank so you, much. Broken. Thank you. Thank you.